Folks, it's time for another NSF Live here. We've got lots of stuff to talk about today. Hopefully you got the intro video there, but it is time to review new information about the Starship Orbital Test. Some new filings have happened that we dug out and made graphs and plots and stuff and now are all over Twitter that we'll be talking about some of the latest, greatest, most important information showing that Starship Orbital may actually be happening. I'm John Galloway for NASA Spaceflight. With me today, I've got Mr. Thomas Berghart. Thomas, how you doing? I'm doing well, Dust. Thanks for having me on, as always. Always a pleasure. Excellent. And also, Ian Atkinson. Ian, how you doing today? Doing great. Always excited for another episode of NSF Live. That's what it's time to do. So that's one of the many things we're going to be covering here today. We've got a lot of stuff to step through. Of course, if you're watching live, this is our live show that we do on Sundays. you got questions for us, tag us in chat. We'll try to answer as many questions as you can ask, I guess, as many questions as we can. But we will try to keep your questions on topic. So as we're talking about the different things that we have to talk about today, like that Soyuz MS-22 return we're going to talk about first, ask questions about Soyuz, make comments about so I use. If we get a good question, we'll ask it over this way. Uh, same thing, we're also going to be covering the Centaur test anomaly that occurred. Tori Bruno tweeting about that one. We've got Virgin Orbit. Sad news from Virgin Orbit, 90%, 85 or 90% of the staff being laid off and ceasing operations there. Not good news for people that love rockets. We've got a SpaceX launch recap, couple launches happening this week as SpaceX marches towards their target of 100 launches this year. Uh, our Starship update, of course, we've got that. And then coming up tomorrow, Artemis 2 crew announcement. That's the list for today, but let's hop right in and uh, get going with Soyuz MS-22. Soyuz MS Thomas? Say that three times fast, Doss. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's all you. It's uh, the, So the latest developments in the saga that has been Russian spacecraft issues at the International Space Station. Uh, this past week, the MS-22 spacecraft came back to Earth without its crew, was originally supposed to return to Russian cosmonauts and an American astronaut back to Earth, but those three crew members will now be spending an extra six months aboard the International Space Station. This was the first of the two spacecraft to encounter a coolant leak issue, um, where the original suspect was a micrometeorite impact, so a small rock from somewhere else in space impacted the service module of the spacecraft and caused a leak, which is a freak accident, but can happen, of course. Um, and as a result of that, uh, this crew, the spacecraft was deemed not perfectly safe to bring the crew back. And so out of an abundance of caution, they launched the Soyuz MS-23 spacecraft to orbit uh, uncrewed because of this damage that you're seeing in here. Uh, and that spacecraft will serve as the lifeboat for the crew while they extend their stay by six months, and then they'll come down on that spacecraft uh, later this year. Um, a different issue cropped up afterwards with a Progress spacecraft uh, that was nearly identical, and now the odds that both of those were caused by micrometeorite impacts, which are very rare, is raised some questions about were they right about the first one, or is this a more systematic manufacturing defect or something on the recent spacecraft that is being that's showing up once the spacecraft spends some time in the vacuum of space. So uh, regardless of the investigation ongoing as to solving and providing some corrective actions going forward, the crews are safe on board station right now. They've got the MS-23 spacecraft docked and ready to go in the event of any sort of emergency on station. Um, MS-22 did come back safely and the crews are looking at the temperatures that it reached on the way down because again, the coolant loop is the system that was affected by this uh, damage. Uh, the First data suggests that it would have been survivable, but very uncomfortable, one such number. And this, these are estimates because it came back without crew on board, which does affect how much heat is generated inside the spacecraft. But these estimates that came uh, from Moscow suggested as high as 122 degrees Fahrenheit, 50 degrees Celsius. Certainly uncomfortable, but would not kill you. Um, and uh, based on the actual uh, measured numbers, which have not been released yet, again, they're doing some inspections. They want to look at different parts of the capsule to see what parts of the capsule might have reached different temperatures and things like that, but did not appear to come out in the worst case scenario that Ross Cosmos was fearing, um, but still, when, it would probably a good call for the crew to stay on station and come back in a healthy spacecraft in a little bit later. 
Yeah, it's it's like, oh, you know, I've been out in the desert and it's 122. Yeah, <laughs> but you weren't wearing a spacesuit strapped into a tiny pressure cooking oven. Um, you had some airflow yeah. around you and that sort of stuff. It's a totally yeah. different thing if you're walking around in shorts on the beach thinking about how hot it is versus right. stuck in the spacecraft at those temperatures, especially for prolonged periods. You know, could you step out and then step back into the shade and cool off or something versus in the spacecraft? Mm-hmm you know the entire time you're coming down that's the temperature until they open that door for you so yeah there are also added concerns we talk about being in like that pressure vessel if the humidity in the capsule rises a little bit too much too that combined with heat can become lethal much more quickly than simply you know being out in a dry desert where it's hot out um if you don't have airflow and you don't have you know fresh air coming in and out um it causes some serious health issues which is why they really made the smart decision to get them a fresh spacecraft and extend their stay. But um, see, the capsule came, re-entered and came in just fine. You can see it there on the ground out in Kazakhstan after landing. Yep. If you put like a pork chop or something in there, it would have been woefully <laughs> undercooked uh, when they opened the door. But it came back yes. in one piece. It looks like a Soyuz that has popped down in the desert. So, Or the steps, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> That's yeah. Joe Barnard's ears just perked up and he doesn't know why. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, geez. So, again, I mean, it's interesting. We've seen multiple spacecraft up there with little damage. They're saying it's micrometeorites. Mm -hmm. Um, Was it space debris or something like that? We always talk about Kessler syndrome, and then somebody did an ASAT test, and there's a bunch of wreckage (laughs) flying around. And does that go through the ISS or not? But also very curious that it was both on the Russian spacecraft uh, that are Mm -hmm. there, and it doesn't seem like we've found any micrometeorite debris on other parts of the space station. That seems right, has exactly. Over yeah. like the space station's career, there have been some damages because of micrometeorites. I think one yeah. of the American radiators is pretty badly damaged. But to have two on similar Russian spacecraft in the same spot within like three months, uh, the odds, the, the statistics are real high up there. You could say astronomical. But see, <laughs> they're astronomically low chances. They're astronomically, yes. exactly. The it's ISS... out of this world how unlikely it is. <laughs> it's just in low Earth and... orbit, so it shouldn't be getting astronomical odds, right? That's true, yes. that's true. Yes. Um, the, the point to add to, so when there was, there was only one isolated incident of this, the reason they said micrometeorite versus debris, which, you, as you bring up, the debris environment in Leo has been affected recently. Right. But there is an odds game where if it was an impact, the direction that the debris comes from, like the side of the spacecraft that gets hit, gives you a bit of a hint because if it's not the same direction that the ISS is orbiting it's going it doesn't actually make sense to be a debris from something that was like also orbiting in low earth orbit it if it comes from a very weird direction ah. it's much more likely that it's a rock from deep space that technically an asteroid but a very very small one um that impacted you and that's why they concluded that originally because it, it was in the wrong spot for it to be a uh, low leo debris uh, gotcha. but now it's possibly too coincident like too much of a coincidence to be debris of any kind and this is actually a different issue gotcha yeah. it's gonna be very interesting they sent uh, 23 up there as the lifeboat to bring them back down because remember the rules about right. the space station you have six people on the station you have to have that many seats in operation operational spacecraft to bring them back down and for for a minute there they didn't have that Right when they knew right. that the damage had occurred, but they hadn't launched 23 yet to be the lifeboat and to bring them down the the spacecraft that's in good shape, there was a time on the ISS where if they had to emergency evacuate it, they wouldn't had have had enough seats that were 100% reliable. If they had to completely right. jump ship, they would have had to come down in the spacecraft. I wonder if they would have done that, or would well, they have? It like, was actually, so, yeah, oh, whoever. Ahead. It's um, is that was actually a bit of a split. Cadence. So what they did, they took um, Frank Rubio's seat, the American astronaut who came up on MS-22. They took his and put it into, uh, I believe it was Crew-6, uh, Crew Dragon. They unbolted um, it or crew something, five. Right? Crew-5? Crew-5 or Crew-6, uh, whichever Dragon and it was It was Crew-5 because then Crew-5 came back, but yes. you, the point stands. Yep, yeah, they put it into Crew-5 in that lower, the lower compartment underneath the four seats uh, where they're kind of could be three seats kind of not it's kind of up in the air as why there's not but they put it down there um as his lifeboat the other two russian cosmonauts who came up on ms-22 they would have gone down with ms-22 and that was seen to be a little bit safer not as dangerous because you only would have had two people in there making heat gotcha. two people in there making humidity um two. so that was kind of their intermittent backup plan yeah, you just put two meat bag also... thermal generators in there <laughs> to keep the heat down go ahead thomas sorry no, you're good. It's also, though, worth noting that that's what Ross Coswell's public decision was, and they were very proud. You know, they were happy to say that 
they don't have any concerns of bringing their cosmonauts back in the event of an emergency in the spacecraft. If an emergency actually would have come up, would some Roscosmos engineers perked up and said, hey, if you need these cosmonauts to come back alive, put them in Dragon, you right. know? Yep. Um, it's hard. Obviously, we won't know now because nothing happened. They were all safe. And once the new spacecraft came up, Rubio Seed is back in the new, fresh, undamaged MS-23 spacecraft and will come down there if the station needed to be evacuated in some way, shape, or form. Gotcha. Um, so, y'all, I, I wasn't getting a lot of questions there. I know we're talking about it, and no, is it a micrometeor or not? Let's see if we can't find a question mm-hmm. about that while I say thank you to some folks supporting the stream. Starting sure. with Dougal here. Thank you for gifting a Red Team membership. Uh, putting out those gifts to other people helps give other people access to the cool behind-the-scenes stuff, like videos and things like that that we put out. Photos of what's happened on a Starbase and that sort of thing. Thank you so much for gifting that sub, but Dougal. Also, John gifted five Red Team memberships, spreading the joy around. And then Chris W. gifted a Red Team membership as well. That's seven Ah, 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 gifted red team membership so far today. Um, thank you all for the support, and thank you even more for, for sharing the cool behind-the-scenes content that we give to the membership program out to some other people. And then here's one from Lars. It is some euros, it looks like, saying, let's hit it off with a small gesture. Five euros in the Super Chat queue there. We really appreciate you, Yars. Uh, Lars, actually, not Yars. Um, however, <laughs> however it is, we appreciate y'all hanging out with us. Whether you're just showing up, clicking like and subscribe or whatever. Give this video a thumbs up. Um, whatever it is, every different way that you can support what we do makes us keep showing up to continue doing what we do, I think, right? Yes. Oh, and there's one from Jim Cavett. Jim Cavett also gifting five Red Team memberships coming in shortly. <laughs> And it's pointing out in the back channel that uh, Ian is dodging merch pies there. I have to go to the other oh, yeah. scene. Uh-oh. There. Sp- oh, wait. Oh, Ooh, now it's oh. Above the merch. Oh, no. Wait, I'll fix it. Time out. Anyways, talk about Tori. <laughs> <laughs> I got this. Well, we're just moving on to Tori now? Yeah, we're talk not about Tori. Any of the Russian Tory questions? Time. No, are there Russian <laughs> questions? Wait, ask a Russian question real quick while I fix this. <laughs> All right, I've got some Russian questions. Uh, James is asking, uh, that. well, he says, I don't understand why they need to spend another six months on the station if they sent another craft up. So... Why Why do you need to extend their stay if you could just bring them down on the spacecraft that's already up there? There we go. Now Ian's getting merch pied. Um, that's a matter of cadence. So you want to have a, a Russian Soyuz dot to the station at all times. You need to keep a Russian cosmonaut on station at all times, just like we always keep a NASA astronaut on station, at least one at all times. There's no... Oh, there is one Russian on the current Crew Dragon mission, to be fair. Um, but they do like to have a full crew of seven on station, and they do like to have a Soyuz dock. Um, the next Soyuz, MS-24, obviously the the like manufacturing cadence is set up based on the launch cadence. So MS-24 is not ready for launch yet. So if they were to bring the crew back right now, they would not have a Soyuz dock to station for a while, and there'd be less crew on station. Right. There's no current risk to the crew on station now. Another question: What happens if MS-23 develops the same problem that they haven't really found the root cause of yet? Then you have another situation similar to MS-22 where you got to launch the next one empty again or something like that. Um, so that's forward work while they work on the issue. Um, but for right now, it is better to keep the station fully staffed um, and keep MS-23 up there. And we've had people spend about a year on station before. We know that that's doable. Um, they have all the supplies and cargo that they need. Um, and so that's why so they don't leave the station without a Soyuz and also only ha- about half crewed um, for the next six months. Gotcha. It's like the space station version of, yeah, we're going to need you to come in on Saturday. Um, yeah, we're going to need you to stay a couple more months here while this and happens. And actually, an interesting thing to note, so like Thomas has said, there have been multiple ISS crew members on the American side who've performed almost a year in space. Obviously, Scott Kelly, we know, was the first to do it, um, and some other astronauts along the way. I think it's about a group of five people now have done year-long stays on the ISS, but it's never been an actual year long. Um, Frank Rubio, because of this situation, will become the American astronaut with the longest continuous stay in space. I think 371 days is the record he's going to be setting. So he'll have over a year continuous in space, setting the record for the longest American stay in space. So that's kind of a neat silver lining. But yeah, Yeah, it wasn't exactly planned, but now it's happening. And that's one continuous, like one continuous stay on station not like yep. cumulative time and space that record i do, do not believe he holds but no um, yeah, yeah. Um, but it'll be a nice thing to get some science on like hey how does the human body live for a little bit longer than a year on the space station things like that 
we'll take it. Definitely a silver lining, though. Hopefully we don't have uh, 23 get a couple holes poked in it, or any holes, even one hole, yeah. too many holes for a spacecraft. <laughs> so <laughs> um, do we have any other questions, Thomas? We're moving along to the next bit of news. We just got, let's see one more. Oh, there's James Atkinson asks, what's the average time between the start of reentry and getting the door open once they land? And that does definitely differ based on spacecraft. But it's like, from like entry interface, it's on the order of, it's less than half an hour, you know, it, you're, I, someone's got to pull up a reentry timeline to get like the exact number, but it's, I think it's like 15 minutes or 20 minutes maybe. Yeah. And even then, the reentry it, yeah. takes longer than you think it does, but it's not, um, it's not, it's like, you know, it's less than half an orbit. So yeah. Most of the time it's just spent under being. parachute. And yeah, most of the time you're literally just floating from the parachute. Yeah. Because um, a lot so of it's... I'm around there, that gives you the ballpark. Yeah, you, you like turn the spacecraft around and you slow it down, but you're still in space. It isn't like as but soon as yeah. you do the reentry burn, you're all of a sudden burning up and have plasma surrounding you. It's You're still right. almost at the same altitude. You're just going a little bit slower, and then you get closer and closer to the atmosphere. But even then, it phases in, right? It's not like all of a sudden... Um, it's the very slow, gradual thing. So there would be a peak as it sort of soaks with the heat, and it's in the thickest... It's almost like max Q for a returning spacecraft. The atmosphere is this yeah. thick, the speed is still this high, et cetera, et cetera. Not really max Q, because it's, it's not stresses on the airframe. But, but that's still the same it, sort it, of thing. Max Q. It, there it is kind of literally max is a max Q, because yeah, you yeah. have the dynamic pressure pushing on the spacecraft. Huh. So, oh, so I, off the top of my head, I don't know what the dynamic pressure, like the peak dynamic, dynamic pressure on reentry versus what it normally is on ascent. I would imagine reentry is actually higher. I would assume so because it has higher G-forces than ascent, but maybe that's probably not an apples-to-apples -apples comparison there. It's also a much smaller spacecraft, so yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I'm going to have to do some <laughs> math after this. <laughs> oh, all right. Moving along. There's some more Super Chats and stuff like that that came in, y'all. I'm going to grab that in just a second, plus a ton of gifted memberships. Thank you all for that. And then all sorts of merch popping up here as well. Apparently somebody went ham in the merch store. We, we don't actually sell ham. We sell metal prints and T-shirts and stuff like that, but... Should we Somebody... text Mark? I think that's a good marketing opportunity. Oh, yeah. Ham selling bacon for Jack. <laughs> oh, uh, no. Dude, like that's a little chimpanzee and call it ham. Oh, no. <laughs> moving. It's related. It counts. Moving right along. <laughs> uh, Tori Bruno with United Launch Alliance getting ahead of something earlier this week. We saw a tweet come out unexpectedly, uh, keeping you posted during qualification testing of the Centaur 5 structural article, hardware experience anomaly. Anomaly doing a lot of lifting there. What exactly is an anomaly in this frame? Who's got that one? I could take that one. So unfortunately, uh, as you kind of hinted, Doss, this tweet's a bit vague. We don't have an exact idea of what happened. Um, now, he said during structural testing uh, later, there, there were a few tweets that he gave about this, giving a few more details here and there. He said it was during a worst case test scenario. So basically, what is the worst possible scenario this vehicle could ever go through? And that's what they were testing. That's exactly why you do this ground testing. Um, so extreme structural load testing, there's a few things this could mean. This could mean the tank was just pressurized, like they had some gaseous nitrogen in there, and we're just kind of compressing it. Um, this could have also meant they had a full propellant load in there, possibly nitrogen or possibly even hydrogen. We don't know exactly what happened here. And depending on what was in the tank and what exactly they were doing, that kind of determines the amount of damage that occurred here. Um, so you don't have too many details on that. Um, there were, however, I did spot on the Huntsville, Alabama subreddit of all places. <laughs> Am I actually uh, supposed to show Reddit here as a source for the news? That's up to you, Doss. You're the producer here. You actually but, want me to do this? Hang on a second. Let's see what Think it of it like. as a crowd reaction shot in a like launch <laughs> broadcast. It's basically the same thing. A crowd <laughs> reaction. This is Reddit's reaction. So from Reddit... Ian, what's going so I was about on? To say, take this with an immense grain of salt, uh, like like a two ton block of salt. Sea of salt. Uh, but there were people in the Huntsville, Alabama subreddit about five hours before Tori tweeted that out, saying, "Did anyone see that fireball? Or did anyone see that boom coming from the direction roughly of the Marshall Space Center?" Um, people are saying here near the ATF, and I actually looked it up. It's right across the street from NASA Marshall. Um, so again, it may, may not necessarily be correlated, but it's kind of interesting just to point out that there was a fireball and was a boom sound um, noted by Huntsville residents around this time. Um, so again, take that with a massive grain of salt, but that's some kind of a, a side of reporting there. 
Um, but yes, yeah, so we don't have too many details on what exactly happened here. It was worst case um, scenario on a structural test article of Centaur 5. Um, we've been knowing that they've been doing some testing on this because they shipped it out from the uh, their factory in Decatur, Alabama a few months ago. Um, now, what exactly this means for the demo flight of Vulcan is not entirely clear at the moment. Uh, Tori did say this was during the worst possible um, test uh, the worst possible conditions they could ever experience in flight, maybe that could make them comfortable enough to say, okay, this may not happen during flight. But as you could see on the screen here, um, there, there's really no idea as to how this is going to affect the flight right now. Um, it, we're, they're very early in the stages of assessing the anomaly, figuring out what happened, and we'll probably figure out over the coming days, coming weeks, maybe even the coming months how exactly this affects the first flight of Vulcan. Currently, it's set for May 4th of this year, so that's just over a month away. Given that this happened so close to the test flight, it would not be too surprising if this delayed. Um, now, it's not really clear what the next flight from Slick 41 is going to be. We do know a few days ago, NASA updated us that July 21st is the next target of the Boeing crewed flight test. That will obviously have priority over the test flight of Vulcan and over really any other flight of Atlas altogether because it's a NASA mission. Um, it's a Boeing mission that's been delayed for a long amount of time, and you need to work around the busy ISS schedule. So. If they can't make it on the May 4th schedule, they have a really tight margin until they need to switch over 41's priorities to crew flight test. So gotcha. we'll be seeing what happens over the next weeks. And real quick, uh, if there's some context. Like, like, what does this mean? We are all used to seeing Starbase. And what happens at Starbase, these stands and stuff like that. Um, here is something. This is actually, Tori tweeted this out a little while ago. But yeah. this is the Centaur 5 structural test article being placed on the stand at Marshall. And this was a video that Tori himself had released. Is this the same thing that would have had the anomaly? Yep, this is, the same, have, yes. this is the same test article. Gotcha. So you can see the big uh, tank there being lifted up like a crane. That's a normal thing that we see lifted up by a crane. <laughs> uh, moved over to the stand. It's got structural, I guess, rings on the top and bottom to help maintain its integrity while they're moving it around for testing. Lowering it down into like a cell, it looks yeah. like. Yeah. We yep, also do have, I know, we have a... Uh, uh, like a Google Earth image of the whole test area, and we can point out where exactly this actually is happening. Right. Um, you may have to yeah, help me out is... with that. Yeah, yeah, all right, yeah. I can, I can indicate which one. Let's see, it's this one. Yes, you got it. Okay, <laughs> good. Um, this one here. There we go. Okay. Um, so this is kind of the larger complex where uh, there's multiple test stands in this image. We're looking near the bottom left. You see, there's an L-shaped structure. We're gonna get some DOS art going in here, I'm sure. Enhance um, first. And That's an L-shaped structure right first. there. There's the L-shaped structure. That's where you, where they initially sat down the article before they actually lifted it into the cell. So just to the right of the thing you circled is the stand where they actually are doing this testing. It's a little bit small. There you go. Perfect. That one. Um, so that's where this is happening. And this is happening a little bit to the south of a much larger stand. That stand used to be used for testing Saturn V first stages, like literally the entire first stage is now uh, used by Blue Origin, and they're getting it ready to support BE4 engine testing on that stand. They've also done a lot of SLS testing in this complex. The L-shaped stand near the bottom was used for some structural testing before. The stand where Centaur was tested was used for some ICPS testing. And on the north side of this complex is the big stand where, if you remember, the big uh, SLS core stage like structural test where they like overpressurized it and it had this huge gouge on the side after the or test, something? You know, as expected. Yeah. yeah, that was done at this complex on the north side. So a lot of different structural test campaigns go through this area. Gotcha. Um, from and, ULA and NASA and things. And the thing to point out, this is a test area. It's not like the, yes. the, the stage had an anomaly in the factory or something. They put things no, here no. with the specific intention of testing them. I don't think yep. this test was intended to be to, to destruction, but they were right. testing it so mm -hmm. that they would learn about it. And they put it through extreme, what Tori said, extreme conditions. Um, sometimes they'll test it to levels that would never be seen in a normal flight or even an abnormal right. flight. Yep. Um, but this was designed to be tested over here. This wasn't like in the factory or something like that. Yeah. Right. And kind of bouncing off that, Tori did confirm that there were no injuries and there was never a risk for injuries in this scenario. So everything worked as planned in terms of the safety factors here. Um, of course, the stage didn't work as planned, but there was no risk of anyone being injured, which is kind of th the main thing that we need to focus on here. Right. Mm -hmm. Before they start to pressurize it, they clear the site. There's probably lights and sirens that goes off, that sort of stuff. Yeah. They maintain personnel away from the area before they start ramping up the extreme pressures and temperatures, whatever it is that they were testing there, loads yeah, that they were it's, testing. 
it's like a starship cryogenic test you clear the pad get everyone out of there even though at this point it's kind of getting safe enough you really it's it's a test you don't want anyone nearby right. when there's anything pressurized yep we got so the big takeaways from this too are gonna have to be like ian said the impacts to the vulcan first flight maybe they'll rule out okay this extreme test case we were testing is not a flight risk we can continue with the first flight while we get another structural auto while we continue to push the envelope for future vulcan flights and things like that um they might also say all right we in order to fully understand this we need to redo this test before vulcan flies that would be another feasible outcome yeah um like we saw show that we are an unlikely very unlikely quote to affect the current atlas 5 centaur that should be a completely different stage yep. um and if, based on the starliner delay if vulcan does slip right we'd expect to see some other atlas fight probably bump up we'll get ula's first launch out of 41 hopefully this year pretty soon um they've got delta 4 heavy coming up but other than that um, 41 waiting for Starliner to be ready, Vulcan to be ready, or they'll throw an Atlas up there and uh, get a launch elf. Good deal. Thomas, grab a couple questions while I thank some folks supporting us here, if you could. Uh, Drunar says, John, please say hi to Mark Watney up there for us. He left. He's not here anymore. I actually had to retape the uh, airlock, and I'm growing my own potatoes in the background. <laughs> He's gone. I don't want to hang out with any space pirates. That guy hadn't uh, taken a shower in months. <laughs> <laughs> he was ripe in the hab. Um, thank you so much for the Canadian dollars there. Some support. Nils, Nils or Niles says thank you, or doesn't say this, thank you for becoming a red team member. Nils or Niles. Westy the third gifted a red team membership, as did Tracy, gifted five red team memberships. Tracy, thank you so much for sharing the love there. Uh, Chris W. did another red team membership. I, could, I was counting the red team memberships, but I can't even keep a count of how many gifted memberships there are. Because Alan C. just did another five <laughs> gifted memberships as well to the red team. Um, whichever way it is, folks, I'm seeing if there were any other gifts. There were tons of gifts. Oh, my gosh. Out of this world became a new red team member. We appreciate you there. <laughs> there are a lot of store messages that say, merch pie to the face. Also felt like I needed to get some updated merch and support the team. That's anonymous. If you buy something from our store, you are able to put a little message in there from us, from you. If you don't want us to say your name or anything like that, there's an option to just leave it anonymous, but you can still put your message in if you buy a metal print or a t-shirt or a hat or a mug or whatever from the store. Uh, so anonymous, I got the same message three times. I'm going to assume you bought three different things and we appreciate the support on all of them. Uh, just a couple more methane man or methane man, whichever continent you're on. Thanks for gifting five red team memberships. We've got Charles. This is a store message from merch from Charles. Thanks for everything you do. You guys are the best. And I got that one twice. So Charles must have got two different things from the store. But uh, Thomas, that gets me pretty caught up here. How are the questions looking? We got just a couple. Uh, Westy the third is asking if we have any idea what hardware specifically this test failed on, and no details other than it was the Centaur article. So we don't know if it was like a propulsion, like plumbing or yeah. section issue, if it was a tank issue, if it was ground equipment around the article and it wasn't the article itself, and there was you know some other configuration error or something like that. We do not know that. Um, the fireball report that comes from Reddit, so two-ton mass simulator of yes. salt or something, mass whatever. Simulator <laughs> of salt. Assault simulator. But, but uh, that does in, that suggests that there was something other than nitrogen involved. The reason you do nitrogen and most of your like just pure pressure tests is because if a leak happens, it won't, nothing will ignite. Like, yep. Um, but if you have hydrogen or if you have hydrogen and oxygen and something ignites, um, obviously that gives you a fireball. So that hints that way but again that's one report we don't know if we can corroborate that yet right yeah um, there's so not we don't like, know more specifics yeah there's not gas station security camera footage of a huge fireball in no. the background or anything like that just a couple of posts exactly. on reddit from people that live nearby so Mar marshall 24 yeah. 7 feed is not a thing yet uh, we'll see if that comes on in the future but uh, depends on how many super chats yet. we get this stream like <laughs> <laughs> here we go i'll go to marshall um, and install some cameras on a pole in the middle of the forest somewhere <laughs> There you go. Uh, Nemo's Odyssey has one more question, too, on this topic. Is it just chance that all of the rocket failures lately have been upper stage engines? I'll offer some thoughts on this. Ian, I want to get your thoughts on this, too. So think yeah. about relativity. Made of flight, first stage flight goes great, but the second stage fails to ignite. Um, what else? The Zuki 2 maiden flight had an upper stage failure. Um, I'm trying to think of other recent examples. Oh, Virgin Orbit's upper stage right. was the failure mode for the Start Me Up mission. Of course, we'll talk about that more later. 
here's what I would think on that. For relativity specifically, think of how many times they tested that first stage, how many static fire tests they did. Yeah. They had a lot of test data. And if the first stage like goes to ignite and something goes wrong, you just don't release the rocket and you can try again after you fix the issue. Right. You do not have that luxury with an upper stage. Yep. So it is much easier to test and verify your first stages. Also, think about Centaur specifically. Centaur is known for its balloon tank structure, meaning that if you like if you just have the stage under ambient conditions, it will collapse on its own weight. Yep. You need to pressurize it to actually have its full structural strength, um, which makes it very, very light. So that's great for a high performing upper stage engine, especially with the hydrogen fuel and all that stuff. But it does mean that you have much thinner margins compared to a more s typical like aluminum structure that can withstand its own weight all the time, or like a stainless steel structure, which is like overbuilt. Um, that, so that gives you some other clues as to why upper stages offer some unique challenges that could make them more prone to failures either during testing or during flight. Yeah. So some things to think about. Ian, anything else to add on that? You stole basically pretty much every word out of my mouth. I was going to say, <laughs> it's a lot easier to test the first stage in flight-like conditions on the ground. You can't ignite a second stage engine during a static fire while a vehicle's on the pad or else things go really bad, apparently. Um, and also with a second stage, you don't have, usually, you don't have the luxury of engine out capability. Um, again, that is a bit of a rarity. But on some missions we've seen on, it was like two Falcon 9 missions, we've seen on a few rockets here and there, you, where you lose one engine on the first stage. Um, on a first stage with multiple engines, it's not a big deal. You can just keep going. Whereas with your second stage, if you lose an engine and you only have one engine or even two engines, you're, you're game over. It, it's There's no chance of going on. So with a second stage, it's a bit more finicky and you don't have the opportunity to get a lot of test data on how it works entirely throughout a flight. Whereas like Thomas said, with the first stage, Relativity had done minute long firings of the first stage on the, uh, the, the the launch pad whereas with the second stage once you take it off the test stand at your test site that's it you can't fire it anymore yep all right i think we got our questions there right so time to move on so. to the disappointing news oh wait hold on one more uh oh is it centaur v or centaur 5 uh -oh. it's centaur 5. 5 it's definitely centaur 5 <laughs> did i say v at some point no, I, someone okay. in chat. Paul, Paul Kelly in chat. I see you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, moving on to the next topic of discussion here. Like, like I said, a, a sadder point. I mean, companies one way or another, but a ton of very talented people affected by this. Virgin Orbit. Got a, a tweet from Michael Sheets here. Always starts with scoop, usually with Sheets. But uh, releasing some news that Virgin Orbit was ceasing operations for the foreseeable future. And 90% of the workforce being laid off there. That's tough. Yeah. This is as far as, and Chad will correct me if I'm wrong. I've done some looking into this. Other than Sea Launch, even though Sea Launch isn't actually totally dead, it's owned by the private S7 airlines in Russia and could come back once they have a rocket to launch and things like that. So I don't know if they even count. This could be the first commercial spaceflight company to cease operations after successfully reaching orbit. Because ah. there have been a couple yep. companies that never got that far, but Sea Launch reached orbit several times. Um, Virgin Orbit reached orbit successfully four times, um, but are now likely coming to an end, which is uh, interesting. Obviously, the small sat market specifically that Virgin Orbit is in, we've all been looking at it and knowing that it's going to be a rough place to say there's a lot of entrance into the market yep. you've got rocket lab was the first coming to market there but you've got players like astra virgin orbit fireflies in there um, you have abl space systems relativities Terran one is in that market ish depending on where you draw the line but um, all of those different companies are vying for dedicated launches for small satellites and virgin orbit despite being i think the second one to reach orbit successfully they beat firefly um, wasn't able to make the finances work. They're on an air launch platform, which was their unique aspect among the other small side launch providers that comes with added overhead costs. In fact, I think Elon Musk has been asked about this in the past about the merits of air launch. And uh, SpaceX did study that years and years ago. Yeah. Think of it this way. You have to crew rate your entire system because you have pilots on that plane. You have engineers on that plane monitoring systems before release and all that stuff. Your rocket basically has to be a crew rated rocket, which you do not have if you just have a ground launched rocket. Uh, um, so there's some added cost there. You have to operate and maintain a 747 uh, without the sense of scale that an actual airline has where you have a fleet of 747s, you know, so the, the math becomes difficult there. Yeah. And you're 
limited to a small rocket that could fit under the airplane. So there are some unique challenges with this prospect. They had some successful flights. They had six flights total. The very, very first test flight with no uh, payload on board did not reach orbit, but they gained enough data that the second flight, they were confident enough to put payloads on it, and it worked. Um, and they had four straight successful missions, uh, all from the Hovey Air and Spaceport in California. Yeah. So they were doing well, but their cadence wasn't really picking up. And then finally, earlier this year, they tried their first launch from the UK at Spaceport Carmel, and that flight was the first customer mission to actually encounter a failure. That is second stage failure. Um, if had that flight succeeded, maybe they would have been on a better path. It depends on what their other missions were looking like and things. But the finances have been troubled. I mean, this is a publicly traded company, so every quarter you get their earnings come out, and you can see what their cash flow looks like. And a lot of people had flagged Virgin Orbit as these finances don't look great. So this isn't entirely surprising. Uh, some of us were aware that this could be coming. Um, but it is uh, the biggest thing to say is, I mean, only 100 employees are staying at this company. All the other talented engineers, technicians, business people, all the different teams of Virgin Orbit are going to be affected by this. Um, luckily, the aerospace industry is huge and thriving, yep. and there will be plenty of other places that I hope those people will be able to stay involved in this the space flight organization or, or find a different kind of field of engineering or something like that to get into. All of those people, I hope, will not have trouble finding new positions. The report from Michael Sheets did include that full severance packages for all the employees, including a specific hiring lifeline for their sister company, Virgin Galactic, which is the Spaceship 2 crewed suborbital spaceflight company, yep. different company from Virgin Orbit. Um, but they are trying to helping some assistants getting them new jobs, especially at that company. Yeah. Um, it... But yeah, so just mostly wishing the best of luck for everyone and hoping that they can all stay involved in the spaceflight industry in a, in a new way, even though Launcher 1 and the Virgin Orbit projects are likely coming to an end. Yeah, it's, it's always something that we say here, like regardless of your thoughts on the company or whatever, there, there are real people behind it, right? And you right. may be sitting there, oh, I knew that was going to happen, blah, 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 their business model didn't work. Whatever you might say about a company that experiences difficulties, there's still real people that work there and they have families that they support and all these they have dreams they put their heart and soul into things sometimes and they've worked really hard on designs that they could be really proud of um, it's not easy stuff and when a company experiences problems like this whenever you're making comments on social media or whatever just remember that there are real people behind it as well so yeah. massive massive sort of thoughts towards everybody that's affected by this, especially something that was really cool. They worked really hard to make work. They had a couple successes under their belt, and then to get the rug sort of pulled out from under them like this, it, it really is a thing for people. And just remember, there are real people, real employees at all of these companies um, that are affected by things like this. So uh, going to choose a couple questions there, Thomas. Yeah, we've got a couple. Uh, we got one from Jez who says, Will this affect Virgin Galactic? And so the two companies were, I, I believe the Launcher One concept was technically originally Virgin Galactic, and then they spun it off yep. and made it a completely separate company. Right. And they, from that point, the companies actually had almost nothing to do with each other other than they were both under the Virgin brand founded by Richard Branson. That was like the only thing they actually had in common. Um, so this shouldn't affect Virgin Galactic directly. Virgin Galactic, to be fair, has their own finance problems. They've been grounded for a while working on safety issues on the Spaceship 2 spacecraft. They're working on getting a new fleet of spacecraft that have taken a lot of the lessons learned from their early flights and trying to optimize the cost for their own uh, operational vehicles so they can fly more missions. Um, so they have their own issues, but like I said, a lot of Virgin Orbit engineers might find themselves working on Virgin Galactic projects now, which could help Virgin Galactic in a way have some more talent under their wing. No pun intended. Um, but other than that, no, no direct uh, effect would be expected, I don't think. Um, a different question from Asher asking, what do you think this means for future air launch attempts overall? Mm. Um, trying to think, Ian, help me out. Are there other air launch developments underway currently, other than Spaceship 2, which is a suborbital space plane thing that's very different? Like I'm thinking like satellite, because like Pegasus is basically dead, right? Yes. That's yeah. the only other one I can think of, unless I'm missing one. Well, the one that doesn't exist anymore, but kind of did, is Straddle Launch. Um, that did go oh, under because of the funding issues and it, it, similar in a scenario like this, it just costs so much to have an air launch system. That's the only one I could think of. Pegasus, like you said, is dead. Um, the I can't remember the plane's name, but that's being reused. The L-1011 is being reused for right, right. DOD missions, mm -hmm. but 
Yeah, yeah. So that the L1011 is being repurposed for something similar to what the strata launches market is, like a hypersonic test bed. You'll air launch things, but not a satellite launch to orbit. Yes. Um, so slightly different sector, but that's a good point. Strata launch and uh, L- uh, Stargazer. That was the name of the L1011. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Um, it's. I mean, it, so, there's always what what the air launch was supposed to bring to the table, right? Like flexibility, and you can fly around weather, and you can have a, a launch site for the aircraft here that's different from the inclination or launch site that you're going to be launching the, right. the actual vehicle in, because the airplane can point in any direction when it when it releases it. And some of those reasons that people thought that it might be a good idea to do the air launch, they don't really seem like they've panned out. Just the operations of Imagine how hard it is to fuel a rocket that is on the ground on a launch pad. That's sitting on the ground, nice and stable, surrounded yep, by all yep. the tanks you need. There's no yep. mass constraints on your GSE, like. It's, but then you got to stack that all on a plane. That's true. The, the GSE, yeah. like stage zero, is the plane, and all of your fueling systems and you're keeping things at right temperatures and pressures and all that sort of stuff has to be contained on the plane in the design yeah. here. So that's even tougher than just being on the ground, regardless of what. Oh yes, we can fly around weather. I, I don't know of any time where that actually happened. We've got to launch today, and we're going to go around this thunderstorm and launch from a slightly different place. Like, what? Yeah, it's not. A thing. I mean, when, when you think about it too, a thing to keep in mind, pretty much as you were saying, this is. Cosmic Girl and like the whole air launch thing for Virgin o- Orbit overall is a phenomenal piece of engineering. There's a lot of things that had to go together to make it right. You had to have your launch control inside the plane. You had to have all your electrical connections inside the plane, monitoring the rocket, making sure the tanks were pressurized and everything was going good. You had to disconnect it from the plane wing. Cosmic Girl was a flying launch pad. And, you know, you could say what you want about the feasibility or the cost structure of that, but just the fact that it was able to be successful in quite a high percentage um four mm-hmm. out of six launches succeeded uh, that of course includes the uh, the first launch um but it, it's a phenomenal piece of engineering and it's there's very talented engineers now going out about in the uh in the workforce and i'm sure they're going to be a uh they're going to be wanted by other companies yeah they did that too with a liquid air launched rocket which is unique pegasus yes. is almost entirely solid fueled. i think it had an optional like storable propellant upper stage yep but a liquid fuel rocket, dropping a liquid engine from a plane yes. and keeping the fuel settled enough to ignite a engine stably, which was the problem on the very first flight, if I yep. don't remember, the first stage engine didn't light properly. Yep. But they were able to fix that for four flights after that, and the and the fifth flight after that, first stage worked fine. Um, that's incredibly impressive. So yeah, when you say when we say talented engineers, they solve some very hard problems to get those yes. flights to orbit. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Any other questions there, Thomas, or moving along uh, let's see we talked about how many launches did virgin orbit do in total six yep. total the first one was a test flight that they had a huge amount of accepted risk so if you count the ones with payload on board they went four for five which is honestly not bad for a small data set like that yeah yep um yep. and then the last one here from tony asking if their assets like engine designs can be bought by someone uh, that is true yes that could in theory happen if someone the engine is a uh, newton three is the first stage engine and newton four is the upper stage engine they're both Carolox engines, and uh, if someone finds the need for a Carolox engine, they could go ahead and do that. They could also buy the plane if they, maybe Cosmic Girl will become a hypersonic research platform or something. Who knows? Yeah. Um, so that's possible. Yeah. It's too early in the process to know, but yes. I'm gonna go check eBay and see if I can find any. Uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah. See if it shows up on eBay. It'll be on that uh, the GSA auction site. <laughs> GSA auction yeah. site. Nice. <laughs> hey, real quick, let's thank a few people. We don't spend a lot of time doing this, but we do want to say thank you. Nicholas Burns became a Capcom member, one of the higher levels of the membership program. There, Jim Cavett, appreciate you as well, gifting a red team membership. Uh, we've got a store message here. I didn't see what product it was, but it says static fire to launch. We're go for full send. I am going to guess that that was uh, some Starship merch, maybe a static a, a metal print or something like that that got purchased there. Appreciate you, Anonymous, whoever you are out there. Darren has a store message as well. This came from a store purchase. You can see them. They keep popping up up there at the top of the screen, y'all. Uh, says, keep up the great coverage to Dart Daz. The Merman Melton Mowbray, England. I do not understand that message, but I still appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Darren, for whatever the heck you just said. Um, Jim Cavett gifted five more Red Team memberships. Like, literally, if you want a, a sample membership, sometimes you just show up and watch the stream, and there's so many gifted memberships here, uh, you have a high possibility of getting one. If you did get one, say thank you to the person who gifted it to you. Here's an anonymous store message saying, must have NSF mug for caffeine during orbital test flight. <laughs> I mean, this is a YouTube name that came after it. Flawed P 
might have been what they were putting. But either way, we appreciate you there. It must have been a mug purchase, if I had to guess. And we got two more from Drew. They're, they're they just keep popping up. Like, they're popping up over there as soon as I click it, and there's the mug, right? Uh, Drunar did two more Super Chats, actually. Timmins Lunch in Canada does rocket lunches from balloons. Ah, somebody was talking about uh, the, have they tried to launch a rocket from a balloon or whatever. I've seen some designs for that. I'm not aware of anybody that's successfully done that yet. Right, it, there's been concepts for that. Concepts kind of thing, for that, yeah. yeah. And it's, It sounds like even more difficult than doing an airplane launch. Yeah. The next you're at message the mercy of the wind. The next message from Drew says, "Sorry, disregard my previous post." <laughs> so, well, too late now. <laughs> too late, yeah. Uh, and then one thing we'll clarify, um, Ian, you did say that uh, Stratolaunch shut down. Not entirely what we meant to say there. Stratolaunch has stopped going for orbital rocket launches, and they now use the rock as a hypersonic test bed, right? Yeah, I, I don't think I said completely shut down, but if I did, yes, yep. that is incorrect. Um, they're doing, I mean, yesterday they literally did a test flight yeah, of rock. Yeah, that captive carry test flight yesterday, yeah. yep. yep. And they're working on a hypersonic test bed for DOD um, test operations. So strata launch is still going. Yep, still going along with the rock out there at Mojave Air and Spaceport. Uh, one last one, and then the queue is nice and cleared here. It's from Sprog, who says, waiting for Starship Heavy, three cores, 99 engines. <laughs> <laughs> I tried an incurable. My computer didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> you need oh, three no. pairs of chopsticks then. 99 <laughs> engines. Of course, we're talking about there joking about a, a Starship Super Heavy booster strapped to two other Super Heavy boosters, 33 engines times three, like the Delta Heavy. It's got a regular old Delta IV, but they strap three of them together, and they have a fine old time. Um, I'm, I'm going to say they better name that Starship Super Duper Heavy. Super Duper <laughs> Heavy. No, that's five. Central core, two sides, and then two on the other sides. That's super duper. <laughs> at that point, do I at least asparagus stage it? Like, you know, <laughs> oh, <laughs> gotta get some fuel cross feed going. In case you oh, want to move no. an entire How neighborhood into make orbit. This? <laughs> Moving right along, we know that SpaceX has been working towards this uh, 100, 100 launch cadence. I want to get 100 launches this year. And they're honestly mm -hmm. not too far behind that pace right now. Um, we had a yeah. launch from I... Starlink. Oh, wait. That's right, right? Pull up the numbers because I want to know what the actual I... pace is. Okay. I'll find I the think exact... they're a little ahead of their pace, actually. Are they really? But I, I, might, I might be a little incorrect there. I think I... Got 22 mis... the, today was the 22nd mission. How many oh, days of 2023 are we into? We're a quarter of the way through, so we're a little under that. Yeah, DOS is right. Okay. Yeah. I was going to bust out Windows Calculator and start doing some math here, but I don't know the chat came to see that. Um, anyways, that whole thing was to talk about some launches. You can see on our family-friendly stream here, we have situated this camera <laughs> in such a way that it's suitable for all ages. Not everyone out on the Internet did that. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about this Starlink 510 here that we saw go off. Trevor. <laughs> we know we know what you did, Trevor. Yeah. That's hilarious. Go so, ahead, yeah. Yeah, we got Starlink Group 5-10 here, another Starlink, uh, lifted off from Pad 40 at Cape Canaveral um, on Wednesday. You can see a beautiful lift off here, uh, much closer than some other missions uh, recently. I know, Thomas, you were out there. You are able to go to Loop Road, which is only about two miles away. So got some great visuals on the live stream from that. Uh, but this had Shout 50... out to the new guy behind the camera tracking this, by the way. Shout out to oh, Max yeah. Evans, the newest member of the NSF team. That's his tracking there. Excellent. Excellent tracking there, by the way. Um, but yeah, so it had 56 Starlink V1.5 satellites on board. Um, now those, of course, are not the fancy new V2 mini satellites we've been hearing a lot about, um, and the ones that they've actually been troubleshooting a lot of issues with recently. Uh, but even though they've been troubleshooting some issues with the V2.0 satellites, some satellites will need to be deorbited. Some satellites they're trying to work on fixing the issues with. Um, they're going ahead with the next Group 6 mission, which carries the V2 mini satellites uh, later this month. So we'll need to be on the lookout for that. Um, so not only did we have that extra Starlink launch on Wednesday, earlier this morning, actually, we had a launch from Vandenberg out on the West Coast from Slick 4E, uh, the first flight of, however you pronounce it, the Tranche, 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 <laughs> Tranche, the Tranche Zero I don't know. Tranche Cerro satellites. Uh, they lifted off from Slick 4E. Now, there were 10 satellites on board there. Eight of those were from York Space Systems, while two missile tracking satellites were actually from SpaceX on board there. Um, you see, of course, to no one's surprise, it was a bit foggy out there at Vandenberg today. Um, but even though it was foggy, we got to uh, see a nice RTLS mission there, coming back to land at landing zone four. Um, so it was a successful uh, launch today. Uh, now, coming up in June will be Tron 
Tranche Tranche Zero Flight Tranche. Two. <laughs> And that's going to have another set of 16 satellites on board there. So these Tranche Zero missions are kind of a demo flight just for these uh, this, this constellation of satellites, uh, just to send up some test satellites, figure out how they all work and ensure that they all work um, before uh, the Tranche One series of satellites comes on board. And that will be split between SpaceX and ULA. But uh, the first flight of Tranche... I need to stop saying it. The first flight of <laughs> this constellation. That's not, there's definitely not how you pronounce That's it. It's my definitely fault. something else. That's like the Looney Tunes pronunciation of, of the mission. Sorry about that. This I feel like Jack, I need a monocle. I Look need like a this. monocle and some tea. Yeah, this Jack Jack's track on the way down this morning was fantastic. Yeah. Love that view. God. I don't know if anybody was watching the live stream. I'm not piping the audio through here, but uh, we got some fantastic sonic booms. Audio was amazing, <laughs> yeah. I highly never... recommend checking out that replay if you haven't seen it. Yep. Always love seeing an RTLS. God. But, yeah, so those are the two Falcon 9 launches this week. Um Another great week for SpaceX. Like Doss said, they're trying to get a 100 launches total this year. They're a little bit under that if they keep a same excuse me, mm -hmm. same linear pace, but of course they could speed up in later quarters. There might've been a little less demand than normal this quarter. So, and of course they do have the later, the latter two thirds or three quarters of the year to uh, continue on the deployments here. But again, beautiful RTLS there from SpaceX today on the, <laughs> the zero with constellation mission, I'll just say. <laughs> I'm not pronouncing that word again. I'm Tra not, I'm sorry. <laughs> Sawyer was very confident with tranche this morning. <laughs> like, like, tranche. That's like the most like, Texas, no offense, Doss, but that's like the most Texas pronunciation yeah. of it ever. They're launching the tranche missions out of California. <laughs> you said it rhymes with ranch, and I was like, ranch? Does it rhyme that with doesn't, really? That doesn't look right. I don't know. Anyways. We'll, we'll have to get uh, an official SDA pronunciation guide. <laughs> uh, they do. So with this launch, they are on pace for 87 launches this year. SpaceX. However, you point out that cadence can increase later in the year. They are adding a new rocket soon hopefully maybe ish um i don't know if that'll fill in the remaining 13 to get to 100 but they're getting there and regardless they are well the biggest takeaway well beyond the pace of beating their record last year last year was 61 i think so yes. they're already well beyond that so if they don't reach 100 this year they've still beaten their own record that they said last year Yep. And at this um, rate, they're likely, given the rapid turnaround of their first stages, the second stage assembly speeding up, at this point, they may be starting to become uh, payload dependent. Mm -hmm. but, yes. Like needing more things um, to launch as opposed to just yes, launching exactly. wheels of cheese. Right, or whatever. Like the rockets are ready, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, They've, they, they seem to have proven that they can launch rapidly like that in terms of the pad turnarounds, the stage turnarounds. But can you just get the payloads on time and all the hardware works together? Yeah, I, I'm just sitting here chuckling at everybody in chat trying to tell us how to pronounce the name of this mission. If they wanted people to talk about their mission, making it imp impronounceable, unpronounceable, whichever way that is, uh, is a good way to get people talking about it, even if they can't say the name correctly. Perfect. Uh, on that front, so this is the first of two flights for Tranche Zero. I'm going to go with Tranche. Um, and with, it, it's called zero because this is like the demo phase. These aren't operational satellites. It's basically just a proof of concept. Um, on board, there were 10 satellites on this particular flight, eight of which were for, uh, from a company called York Space Systems, a relatively common satellite manufacturer. Those eight satellites were communication satellites for U.S. military. All the satellites have military purposes. Yep. Um, the two other satellites were actually made by SpaceX. Um, not a lot of details to know because, again, these are classified payloads. There's been... Um, reasonable speculation that they're based on a Starlink bus, but that's not confirmed or anything. Um, and those two satellites are supposed to be missile warning satellites. Um, so, so think a smaller term scale of like the Sibbers constellation or things like that. Um, that's at least as much as we know publicly. Um, and the next flight will carry a bunch more of those demonstration satellites for both communications and missile warning satellites. Um, and then that'll be followed by Tranche 1, which will be the actual operational satellites in that. I don't remember when that begins deployment. Not, I think, in a couple of years. Right. They haven't even issued the launch contracts yet. Um, but that's what this is in support of. It's basically a low-Earth orbit constellation to support things like communications, missile warning, and also in the future, just as a test bed for new sensors and things like that um, for U.S. military purposes. So that's what they're launching on these flights. See, I just thought that a programmer got a hold of the mission naming sequence, and they're like, the array starts at zero, and it's like, it's the first light, it's tranche zero. Anyways, programming joke. Exactly. Um, what else? Do we have some uh, jo do I almost asked, do we have some jokes from chat? We certainly have some <laughs> jokes from chat, but more, more do we have questions from chat right now? 
Uh, yeah, we got a couple. Uh, Skull Nation asked, why isn't pad 39A being used as often as pad 40? I think 39A is being held up by something, right, Ian? There's a few things actually holding it up, uh, one of which is a, uh, a a certain shiny rocket that's being built there, um, or it's, its launch site is being built there. Yeah. So SpaceX is building the second Starship launch site at pad 39A. Um, so not only that, so they're going to kind of not want to launch from 39A as often, so they don't need to keep pausing and restarting and pausing and restarting construction. Um, but also they have to deal with the Falcon Heavy manifest. This year is going to be very busy, at least in terms of Falcon Heavy launches um, compared to previous years, as well as cargo and crew Dragon missions, which do require Pad 39A as well. So um, they do have a bit of missions that require the capabilities that 39A offers. Uh, 39A, as you can see here on Space Coast Live. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, there's, they, there's are a they lifting a booster there. right now? Yeah. Oh, yeah, they're lifting a booster right now. <laughs> what, well, what timing. Well done, Dust. Perfect. <laughs> totally intentional. <laughs> How about radio. that? Right, Shout the out to Fleet Cam, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> that is, so that's the, that's the booster from the Starlink mission we were just talking about. Huh. Yeah. That's live right now, nice. y'all. This this is like I literally went to NSF.live, which can get you to all of our 24-7 streams, and I clicked on this, and they're lifting a booster. Of, co of course, they're lifting it behind a bulk carry ship there, so we won't see it for much longer. But, yeah. but huh. And as you can see there at the bottom, the next launch is from Slick 40. That's Intel Sat 4, 4E. Pardon our double 7. overlays. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Nice double overlays <laughs> there. But yeah, in the top right corner and the right middle camera, you can see the action out of pad 39A. You can see in the middle right, that's the Starship launch tower. They have the chopsticks installed on there. Uh, the next major step really should be getting the launch mount on there, the big circular launch mount. Oh, yeah, the table. Um, yeah, and we don't know exactly when that's going to happen. We don't even know the status of that launch mount, really. They could just be waiting. Maybe they, they don't even have the... Uh, they don't even really need to do it yet. Uh, but in the top right corner, you can see they have the strong back there on the pad. Oh, thank you, Das. Sorry. But yeah, so they're really busy with Falcon Heavy this year. They're busy with Crew Dragon and Cargo Dragon, as always. So 39A launches, commercial launches from 39A, are always on the back burner for Falcon 9. Yep. I was getting ready to go over there, and I'm like, I can change what this stream is showing. <laughs> and then by the time I did that, I'd forget to put it back. Then people would yell at me because the booster's <laughs> moving. I, I didn't do that. Uh, but anyways, yeah, that was... I, I almost went in there and was <laughs> like, oh, I'll just put it full screen. But the booster was lifting, so I didn't want to do that. Yep, yep. And now the booster's going off frame. we got to deal with that. So anyways... Um... Tell the ship to move. Back up. <laughs> Somebody talk about something else so I can aim fleet cam here real quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got you. I got uh, it. We got some more questions about the Falcon 9 launch oh. cadence. Uh, Asher asking, when is the next version 2 mini launch? No earlier than. Uh, no earlier than this month. Um, we know they were troubleshooting some issues after Group 6-1. That was the first batch of the version 2 mini satellites. Um, as expected, it's the first batch of satellites. Elon came out and said, more or less expected. Some will get deorbited, others will get troubleshooted, and then hopefully raise up to their operational flights, and then they'll start launching the next batches and pick up from there. Um, so, and they're filling in the gaps by just changing those flights to version 1.5 satellites, the satellites that they've been launching for a while. Um, so, hopefully, this month, though, they'll get back to some of the newer satellites. Um, we'll stand by for an actual no earlier than target for that. Like we said, the next Falcon 9 launch from 40 is an Intelsat mission. Um, also, that satellite is hosting a NASA payload, so that's kind of interesting. Stay tuned for our coverage of that. Um, and then 39A, the next flight from there is a Falcon Heavy mission with a VSAC communications satellite. So a um, little bit of a gap before some more Starlink missions. I don't know off the top of my head what the next Vandenberg mission is. That might be a Starlink mission, um, but we'll have to get back to that. Gotcha. Um, other questions here. John Ryan asking, as boosters 1058 and 1060 have both reached 15 flights each, will SpaceX up the extension to 20 or expand those boosters on future missions? I believe we are expecting those to return to the flight rotation shortly. They did reach the milestone of 15 flights, and I, that usually comes with a almost destructive um, kind of inspection, so they can really get as much data as they can, as they have flown more times than all the other boosters. Um, and it's possible that that means that they'll retire those boosters soon, sooner than other boosters that reach those numbers that don't need the huge inspection because they got the data from these boosters yep uh yep. but we have not we're not expecting them to be out of the rotation yet I, they're out of maintenance you know they're out of service right now as they get some data from them and things like that but i think we're expecting them to come back hopefully soon um i don't think we have a time frame yet but they're not out yet if that answers your question and thing too to keep in mind is that newer boosters have kind of benefited from the knowledge spacex has gained from these older boosters so newer boosters are 
in some ways easier to refurbish. We've seen Elon say on Twitter, it's easier to refurbish the boosters, say, in the 70 series than in the 50 series because they've able to they've been able to learn lessons here and there onto making it simpler and making it more reliable, things like that. So it it wouldn't be too shocking to see these boosters get retired soon. Yeah. Also, Alex in the back channel, thank you for reminding me. The nice Vanderbilt launches Transporter 7, so that's not a Starlink mission either. No, that's the one of the right shirt missions. So there uh... you go. All um, right. One more question on the Falcon 9 topic, Dust. Sure. We got time, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, Karen says, when Falcon 9 lands, does it target the drone ship specifically, or does it tar just target the GPS coordinates and hope the ship is there? Um, so the drone ships, when we call them autonomous spaceport drone ships, it's because they are autonomously maintaining a position relative to a certain GPS coordinate where the Falcon 9 is supposed to land. Granted, there is some level of margin there where if it drifts a couple feet to the left, like it's not going to miss the landing, right? Um, so I don't know how big that margin is, but there's some amount of give there. And I believe as Falcon 9 goes through its final descent, probably starting around the entry burn, the guidance should be aiming towards the ship specifically and not just a designated GPS point. Mm -hmm. I know the, at some point the rocket starts talking to the drone ship and vice versa, um, but I do not, I don't know where exactly in flight that happens, but it does target the drone ship specifically. It's not just hoping that the drone ship is in the right place. They do have, I believe it's either like a laser or a radar retro reflector, yeah. a, a radar instrument on the bottom of the first stage that kind of says, okay, the drone ship is exactly here, steer in. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Uh, either way, we always like seeing those things come down and land because it yep. is not boring yet, especially because SpaceX gets the cameras on the drone ship and the rockets for us. Like so many other companies could have so much to learn from SpaceX if they're trying to hype up their new rocket that has such a fancy paint job on it. Maybe they should make sure that they have lots of cameras on the rocket and they share those views with us when it takes off. <coughs> Tori. Um, anyways, <laughs> moving right along. <laughs> moving right along to Love our it. next topic here. It is time to talk about Starship. A rocket without a paint job, if I may say. Without a paint job. An Olin <laughs> has a nice paint job. with though. no paint job. <laughs> there you go. Um, we've, saw, we've seen a lot of things going on out at Starbase. Of course, Booster 7's back on the OLM. We saw, we'll saw. we get all this imagery up here in a second. Um, Ship 24 is back on the launch site, waiting for the lift. It got, actually got rolled back late last night. We're going to be standing by for some stacking, where they create the full stack once or more, which seems like an important step before trying to launch the ship to orbit. You should probably put it on probably, top of the yeah. booster first. But it's debatable. The, it, it, debatable. <laughs> you will not go to space the day if the booster takes so off. The shuttle and the ship says is... it can be strapped to the side, Dos. It's fine. <laughs> yes, a Starship oh, shuttle gosh. when. Technically, <laughs> the best kind of correct. Um, the big news this weekend that came out late in the middle of the night was that SpaceX made some filings, mm -hmm. and there were some alert notices put out to some mariners on dates that are probably sooner than you would think. <laughs> Who's got this yeah, one? Huh? <laughs> yeah, so we've gotten some of the first <laughs> regulatory filings of the Starship orbital flight test. Um, Alex, you could see here, uh, actually did some digging, found the maps and made the maps showing exactly where these marine notices are at. And they seem to come from an area in South Texas near a town called Brownsville. And they <laughs> seem to be ending just north of Hawaii. Um, <clears throat> Hmm. We've got a cool but, interactive map here that Alex made for us. And uh, well, look if at that. you're wondering whether or not this is about Starship, I don't know. Are there very many other launch pads that are right here? I think there's a few. No, no. <laughs> but yeah, so this is like the first, some of the first big regulatory filings. Now, like I said in the tweet, this goes from April 6th to April 12th, which is, you know, if my calendar is correct, four days away from starting up. Now, given the fact that Ship 24 is currently nowhere near Booster 7, I think that's kind of starting a little bit early. So these may have been filed a little early. Even April 12th sounds a little early, but again, it's still a great sign to see, you know, they're starting to get these regulatory permits filed. They're starting to get all this organized and we're getting an idea of what their actual plans are for the orbital flight because the only indications we've really had are from some very preliminary FCC filing saying, hey, we kind of want to do a semi-suborbital, semi-orbital mission and we haven't heard anything since, but this confirms that they are still on board with that three-quarters orbit, orbital flight mm -hmm. test. Yep, I mean, um, here's the other side over here. 
Um, yeah, this exactly. is the launch hazard zone. Like if there's an anomaly on launch, it ends up somewhere over the Gulf. Uh, if it does make it all the way up to the almost orbit trajectory, it comes down some 50, 60 miles north of uh, Hawaii, the Hawaiian island chain there. So yeah. that is the map made from those coordinates. But the dates were the most surprising. We sort of knew yes. they weren't going to be launching over Houston and probably not <laughs> over, right. you know, the Yucatan Peninsula. Um, mm -hmm. These new coordinates showing this hazard zone, like splitting the gap there right between, uh, this is Key yep. West down here, and Cuba to the south. I mean, it's not a very long gap that they're shooting through there. And, of course, SpaceX has filed the trajectory, or I guess the, the Marine notices, support a trajectory that shoots that gap, right? Yeah, and yeah. I was actually looking on Twitter, Jonathan McDowell, uh, Dr. McDowell uh, actually did some, I, I don't know exactly what to call it, some map physics or whatever you would say. Nice. Um, and he determined it would be approximately a 26.5 degree inclined orbit. Orbit, obviously, in big quotation marks, is you know, um, the Energy apogee is ex right. Yes, the apogee is expected to be around one thousand kilometers, so it'll be going kind of high up before coming back uh, down and around. Again, that could have changed since then, but uh, yeah. So this is the flight trajectory we're looking at. It's going to cut right across the equator, go over Africa, then come back down over uh, just above Hawaii. Yep. So. As you can tell, because it's coming down to land above Hawaii in the ocean where there's nowhere to land, uh, this ship is going to be expended on this mission. And that is if it even makes it to reentry, if it even makes it through reentry. Um, of course, this is a flight test. There's a lot of unknowns here. There's a lot of things being tested. Um, even making it really to stage separation would be a major, major milestone here. Um, but if all does go to plan and the ship makes it through reentry, it will be landing probably hard in the Pacific Ocean. Um, the booster, we don't know exactly what's going to be happening with the booster. Um, there has been kind of some hints from Elon that they might try an attempt with the chopsticks. This probably isn't too likely. I don't know what DOS is drawing on there. Is that a person on a surfboard trying to catch it? It's a kayak <laughs> and the guy has jack. a big beard. <laughs> <laughs> and a camera. I'm kind of confused. There, there's no bacon, so this can't be Jack. Oh my gosh. You need to cool yeah. it with like eight pounds of bacon. Bacon there over go, there bacon. next to it too, right? <laughs> <laughs> We're sending Jack out, and t Jack's gonna get the launch scrubbed because he'll be he'll be in the Notemar area. <laughs> I but, hope not. But yeah, so that's the plan oh for the goodness. orbital flight test. Um, the dates, like we said, are from April sixth to April twelfth. Those are not necessarily set in stone. There is no launch license out yet, which is the next major yeah. thing we're looking for from the FAA. Once the launch license is announced and once it's made public that hey the FAA says hey you're good to go we like what you got we want to see this thing fly then we can start to get a bit more excited then we can start saying okay we are likely x amount of days away from the orbital flight when that launch license drops we really do not know it should be sometime in the next few days it could be tomorrow or it could be two weeks from now yep um we're just gonna have to keep our eyes out and see but Overall, it's just exciting to see some actual permitting come out, whether or not they stick to it. It's still cool to see uh, the mission profile as well. Yeah. It's, 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 again, we're all sitting there waiting it, and we've done so much, honestly, speculation and hoping just based on what we see at Starbase. It's like, oh, the boosters now roll back out. Oh, the boosters got these new covers on it. Oh, they put it back on the orbit. Like, all of these little just circumstantial things, and it's not actual paperwork that says anything. Them stacking the booster could mean that it could sit there for a year, right? Hopefully not. Good grief. <laughs> but uh, this is actual paperwork. Can you trust the dates? Well, I saw some people sort of saying, oh, there's other stuff that collaborates it. Uh, the WB-57 is going to fly on this date. Oh, it must be happening on this yeah. date. Yep. Well, that placeholder's been there for months, folks. Like, it's just been <laughs> yeah, hanging yeah, out yeah. there for the longest time. If you actually follow the stuff, you would know that, right? So, right. It, so he, he, you mentioned the WB-57. So there is a public-facing calendar yep. for all of NASA's, like, airborne assets on the missions they'll be going and stuff. Yep. That calendar is updated, like, once a month. Yep. <laughs> so... You cannot take anything on that calendar with any sort of certainty, yeah. especially ones that coincide with rocket launches. Some of the like airborne science missions are like, well, that schedule is pretty solid once you schedule it because you're flying a plane. Like it's not, it's like an airline schedule. That's much more reliable than a rocket launch schedule. Yep. Um, so some of it's yep. useful, but the uh, WB57 imaging of the the launch, don't base it on that schedule. Also, and also, and also this out there. Oh, go ahead, Ian. 
I was just going to say, it's not even certain that WB57 is going to actually make it out there. I believe they were going to fly for SN15 or SN11 or something like that. But because the launch was delayed by a day, they had right. to cancel the WB57 flight. So it, it's it's a point of data for sure to keep in mind, but it doesn't seem like that's a certainty. Maybe for the orbital flight test, that will be seen as a bigger thing. And NASA really wants that imagery of how Starship launches. But um, again, there's something to keep in mind. Yeah, we did. I, I'm just going to start rolling some tape in the background here. Um, like we were sort of mentioning, we saw all sorts of things happening at Starbase. Of course, Booster 7 being lifted back onto the OLM was a big thing. Does Booster 7 being lifted to the OLM guarantee that there is going to launch in the next two weeks? No, absolutely not. We've seen it lifted before. Um, but it's a step in the right direction. It's not going to launch if it's not on the launch mount, right? Um, same thing with the ship. The ship was over in the rocket garden. We saw them sort of finishing up the work to the ship they were finishing the final heat the, the, the tiles the tps up on the top near those old squid load points and then they were doing a lot of work sort of inside we saw lifts going in and out of it for weeks and then we saw people sort of working around what, what we think is the fts area but do, do any of those things mean that it's launching in two weeks no you need the ship to be at the launch site so we saw that too it was like one till 3 a.m eastern time uh the other night and we did a stream for that in People come back, and I feel like there's an amount of fatigue for this. They're like, oh my gosh, you clickbaited us. Like, you said that it was the final lift. Well, no, I put a question mark when I put the stream title in there. It was final lift. My voice went up at the end because I put a question mark. Um, but yep. it's all steps in the right direction. It's not launching if it's not on the pad, if it's not stacked, et cetera, et cetera. Right, y'all? Yeah, and there's still a lot of work and, and to do here. Go ahead, Thomas. Sorry. Yeah, man, we don't know exactly what all those mountains are going to look like. We are hoping this is the last lift, you know, but yep. things can change. Plans are changing all the time here, so. Yep. Yep. Exactly. And there's still some work that needs to be done. There's still some scaffolding around the orbital pad. You kind of don't really want scaffolding there when you're launching something. Um, so th there's still a little bit of work to be done here and there. Maybe some inspections of the booster. Yep. Once they stack the ship, maybe some inspections of the ship and maybe even some cryogenic tests, maybe some wet dress rehearsals. There's they may want to do a little bit more testing to make sure everything is good before launch day. Um, and we don't know exactly what's going to be happening there. Yeah. I, I really think, I mean, I, I've been talking about it this way, but I wonder if we're not in sort of like a race condition, right? Where who's going to be there first? Are they going to have a full stack? And is Elon going to be out there on the launch pad looking at his watch saying, well, we're waiting for a launch license. We're ready. Well, they're not waiting yet. Mm -hmm. They don't have the stack yet. Or is the FAA going to issue the launch license and the ship's not even stacked yet? Whichever way you put it, all of the things have to come. Oh, look, they lifted the booster. How neat. <laughs> um, all of these things have to come together in order for the flight. But this was the first paperwork that actually had these dates that were very soon. It wasn't like, oh, yeah, November of last year, they said eh, April, maybe. You know, like some yeah. date that that's, far yeah. the, that's that far in the future. This was a date that was within the next two weeks. Right. Mm -hmm. And I have a question. So there's the April 6th net. Sometimes for ca launch rehearsals, things like wet dress rehearsals and things like that, you actually do enforce the normal launch hazard zones as part of the rehearsal. Mm -hmm. It is possible that the reason the dates, and this is me completely speculating, I haven't even heard this anywhere. Yep. No one else has said this as far as I know. It could be a sign that they're going to get the ship stacked any day now and are hoping to be, within this week, do a full mission rehearsal short of, like, ignition and liftoff. And that could be why the zones are on those dates. And then we'll see them refiled again for the actual flight yeah. That's a, as one yeah. possible explanation. That's very true. That is a really good point because we've talked about uh, the lack of experience. And it's not a bad thing. It just means that they haven't done a lot of launches from here, right? Um, think of Cape Canaveral. And Cape Canaveral has been launching rockets from the Cape for literally mm -hmm. as long as we've been launching rockets. The yes, Coast Guard there has tons of experience enforcing the no the keep-out zones, right? NASA, mm -hmm. the 45th, the communications infrastructure there has been operating for a long time, and there's a lot and of Some boats still get it wrong. Well, Sorry. They do. No, you're <laughs> right. Relativity. But they, they have a lot of experience um, working that at the Cape. Brownsville doesn't have the same experience. Even just the lines of communication with the local law enforcement and stuff like that, they, they haven't had a lot of practices. What, 18 months ago or so, they uh, <clears throat> had a couple suborbital test flights, but it's not like every Thursday they're launching a Starlink out of here. So, Thomas, right. I hadn't thought about it in that light, but maybe that's a great point. Like, they really should step through um, not just SpaceX's internal stuff, but communication with the public agencies that help them enforce the safety of the area. Um, that does make a lot of sense. It's, it's good speculation, I think. 
Yeah. I pre- I'll take I'll take good speculation. Good speculation. I'll take good. appreciate well that. well founded speculation or something. I like we'll it. see if I'm right or not. <laughs> yeah, but we we have been sprinkling. You know, even Alex in his tweets um, made it very clear. Expect those dates to change. Like if you're booking tickets right. to go down to Brownsville, you're booking hotel yes. rooms or anything like that. I don't know that you should be rushing to town for the sixth. But uh, just watch for the launch license to come out. That one's going to be a real a real indicator, yeah. right? Um, yes. We need to get the ship stacked. Of course, they could stack the ship after the launch license. But it was paperwork in the right direction, which was good to see instead mm-hmm. of just guesstimating based on where the ship has rolled today, right? Right. <laughs> exactly. We got some other questions about this. And on this note of the trajectory, Starship, a some version of Starship, Starship without the valves, uh, asks, uh, will Booster 7 do a boost back burn? And the hazard zones don't necessarily confirm one way or the other what exactly they're doing with the booster. We know the ship is going to be expended because, well, there's not going to be, there's nowhere for the ship to land within the reentry hazard zone. Um, the booster could fall within that corridor, just be expended. They could do like an experimental reentry, like, or not, they don't do an entry burn, but a landing burn yep. to like soft splash down in the water downrange. They could also attempt a boost back burn and splash down off the coast. They could do a, a boost back burn and try to get caught on the first flight. All of those fall within the specific hazard zones. I still don't think we've had any recent, any sort of official word as to what exact the exact objectives for the booster are on this flight. Ian, thoughts? Yeah, I mean, like you said, we haven't heard anything official. Elon has been speculating on Twitter here and there that, hey, we may try a chopstick landing. Oh, no, we may not do a chopstick landing. If you had to ask me, I would say it's very likely they will do, they will not be bringing it back to the launch site. Now, what they do instead kind of depends. Maybe they'll just straight up expend it. It would not shock me if they do a sort of CRS style semi boost back burn and landing. Um, they could also sure. opt to do a sort of simulated landing where they say, hey, booster, the ocean surface is actually two kilometers above the ocean surface. Yep. Have it land there, shut down, and then blam. Um, of course, that's all pure speculation. But in my eyes, it seems more likely that they will not try to bring it back to the chopsticks uh, because this is a brand new flight of a brand new vehicle. You don't know if the Raptors are going to ignite for the landing burn. If they don't ignite and then you suddenly have, even if it just lands off coast, you still don't want like a missile landing on Boca Chica Beach. That sounds like an environmental disaster, a clean disaster, just a mess overall. So yeah, I think it'll be at least a flight or two or five until we see a attempted catch with the chopsticks. Yep. <laughs> Let's see here. We probably have lots of other questions. Really quickly, I'm going to say thank you to a bunch of folks. John gifted five more red team memberships. Tom Dalton gifted five red team memberships. Uh, Methane Man, these were merch messages. Let's see what pops up. This is Howdy from Texas. We appreciate you there, Methane Man. That is a sticker, a Texas Tank Watchers sticker on the back of the uh, laptop there. What's the next thing in there? No. Oh. And another sticker. Okay, I have uh, to, like, uh, squint uh, down to read to what the moon it says. And Mars th- the stickers are small, it's, to be it's fair. the Moon and Mars sticker. Yeah, there you go. Um, Tom Dalton also says, uh, NSF, where gift memberships are spammed. It's true. Uh, we sometimes get hit with merch pies if you buy something from the shop, but you might get hit with a gift membership if you're hanging out in chat during one of our shows. Um, John has a super chat from a little bit ago. Uh, this is actually going all the way back to ah, the T-Tab issue when they aborted that uh, SDA launch last, I think it was Thursday, was the first abort, Mm. but uh, they said that it was an engine issue, apparently, on the launched broadcast, but I don't see any other confirmation on exactly what that was. Yeah, I I think that's all they said. Yep. Uh, How reliable is T-Tab as an ignition source? Pretty reliable. Sometimes it goes off when you don't want it to go off. You have to be very careful (laughs) with T-Tab, because it is very energetic uh, when you let it loose. Once uh, it touches oxygen. Yep. John, thank you so much for the support there. Uh, Douglas, I saw a couple people purchasing caps from the store, but Douglas said, nice cap, Das. Looks, got a cap bought up there. Yeah. This is the special Das edition cap. It has dark thread on it, and uh, the one on the store has light thread on it. Sorry, this one's only for me. Um, either way, <laughs> Douglas, thank you for uh, the support in the shop there. Bought a couple things. Starship says, hey, Ian, I have a paint job. Oh, Starship 20. 20- 24 that is a little S24 logo. Yeah. 
and like they, they a did kind of logo. yeah okay paint, paint, they painted like is some it paint black or is it the like tiles. a decal that you wrap on i feel like it's a final decal job, or something but right that's what i would yeah. six to one half dozen the other <laughs> they did um, do they did paint around like some of the heat shield tiles so they don't have like the, the jagged hexagonal edges it's just like a straight mm. black edge yep but uh, it's let worn me, off. Let me grab a couple more here. Harry Vlog says April 12th is your birthday. Harry, hey, not going to completely rule it out, but expect mm. for some dates to change <laughs> there. Uh, either way, happy birthday to you. Roseanne DeVasto says, not sure what it is exactly, but have they got clearance to launch? Roseanne, when we talk about uh, the FAA launch license, that's what we're talking about. And that has not been issued yet. There will be a public announcement and there's, there will be much rejoicing, honestly, when the FAA oh, yeah. issues the public launch light or not the public launch license, it just issues the launch license. Uh, that is going to be big news. It has not happened yet. As far as we're aware, the FAA is working towards it, but there's no official date. Like, it's due by Thursday or anything, right? Um, but that is the official permission from the FAA, at least, to launch is that launch license Launch license we're looking for. Um, there's other, like, day um, of launch things, like the range is clear and launch director yeah. says go and that sort of stuff. Sorry, I jumped on somebody there. No, you're good. I was just going to jump on that same discussion. We've got a couple questions related to the launch license thing. Cool. Um, Simon was asking how they can release the Marine notices even though they don't have the launch license. So things don't have to be done, like, in a very specific order. You need all the things done before you can launch, Yep. but you can get the marine notices first, you can do the airspace notices first, you can get the license ahead of time and then put those things out. Like All those things can happen in kind of any order you need. You just need them all before you like enter the countdown. Right. Um, the license can come in like 10 minutes before you start fueling if you really need to. Like, um, it's Yikes. not actually a huge deal. Um, so, and, and honestly, that's happened pretty, it's almost happened before. Like. The FAA said, look, you're about to have your license. We're literally just signing the DocuSign on, you know, <laughs> on whatever. We'll send it like, to you for you electronic get, signature. Get, get ready for your window tomorrow. Go ahead. We'll close the airspace and all that stuff, and we'll get you your paperwork before you start fueling. Yep. Uh, um, it, stuff like that. So what we're talking about specifically with what was released, this is literally saying it's like hazardous operations, right? Rocket launching and then hazardous operations space debris. And what was put out is basically – if you're on a boat and you're in these coordinates, like these little waypoints that draw out a, a bit of the map, right? Um, between these times, daily 6 through 12 April, right? Here's these Zulu times, 11.25 Zulu to 17.10 Zulu this morning. Um, if you're in these coordinates, you better look out, or you shouldn't be there, honestly. You have to clear out uh, because they're going to be doing a rocket launch. Now, that doesn't mean they're going to be doing a rocket launch. That just means that they have warned people who have boats that might be in the area that they have to clear that area in these times. These are very likely to get modified or amended or whatever, updated as they sort of dial in the date. And they may re remove some of the dates. They may expand some of the dates. It may be March 20th. Hey, well, it can't be March 20th. April 20th or something yeah. like that, right? But March 20th, 2024? No. <laughs> No, no, please. It needs to be sooner than no. that. Stop. It needs to be sooner than that. I'm going to get it run out of the stream on a rail with the chat yelling at me. <laughs> Sorry. I forgot which month it was. Um, But the, the notices that we're talking about are literally hazard notices. Clear your boats and ships and kayaks and whatever else you have, uh, <laughs> cartel submarines, whatever it is, out of these areas during these windows. And there's still other bits of paperwork that have to come. That's right. Uh, <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> Moving yeah, I on to the next the question. Way. Somebody else talk. <laughs> Jerry, so Jerry was asking about a good question, though. Does the FAA have any say over other rocket launches? I only hear about it for Starship. Yes, you only hear about Starship because that's like the big ticket item that everyone asks about. Yep. The FAA licenses every commercial spaceflight launch, however. So every Starlink mission, a Falcon 9 carrying a commercial communications satellite, an Atlas V carrying commercial communications satellites. Yep. Um, th you know, Firefly missions from Vandenberg on with commercial missions, all of those are licensed by the FAA. Um, and you need a launch license to do those. Um, Astro launches, Rocket Lab, you name it. Yep. Um, the ones that the only ones that don't, if it is a NASA or a US military mission, usually those are licensed differently by either the US Space Force or NASA. And I don't and NASA might even do it through the Space Force. I don't remember exactly how the contracting structure works, but um if it's a not commercial mission in any way, then the FAA doesn't necessarily need to be involved. But otherwise, the FAA licenses all commercial launch vehicles, and it's for the purposes of maintaining public safety and things like that. Um, you're just hearing about it a lot for Starship because that's the big launch license that we want to be issued so that that big test flight can happen. Yep. So you're hearing about it a lot, but they do all the other launches too. Oh, let's hit some more questions, shall we? 
And uh, yeah, I got another one here from uh, Outdoorsman Show. Well, we see a lot of tankers show up before launch. I guess we'll need that. We'll need a lot of methane. We'll need a lot of liquid oxygen. Probably need a lot of nitrogen. I guess they might need water. I don't think there's any helium in Starship anymore. I think they have like their own well system for water. Okay. Okay. So so they don't need water tankers. Is there helium anywhere in the Starship system anymore? Because it's autogenous pressurization. So you don't need it for tank pressurization. It might be. It might still be partial helium in the system. I I don't think we've heard that they completely got rid of it for a long enough. Autogenous Uh, pressurization. They still use helium. There we go. Yeah. It's only in little bits. So I'm sure I would not be shocked if they already had enough there. Sure. But I mean, methane and oxygen are obviously the big ones. Yes. Um, and probably nitrogen. I would not be surprised if a hefty amount of nitrogen will be required on site and need to get tankered in. Yep. Um, but that'll be another good sign that they're getting close. Um, might need them ahead of a wet dress rehearsal, though, too. So could be a false alarm. We'll see. <laughs> I'm getting a ton of flack um, for uh, apparently issuing a notice to cartel members. Um, for the flight. <laughs> I was kidding. I mean, I, surely they're not signed up for the FAA email list that sends, or the no TAMs or whatever you're on that email list for. So, my goodness. Anyways, um, let's see what else we got. Um, does the FAA only have jurisdiction in the U.S. or other countries? So, America. So, Rocket Lab launches from New Zealand are also FAA licensed because it's an American company, right? Um, although it's uh, it's usually based on the launch operator, so that's the only example I can think of. Like they don't license Chinese launches, they don't license Russian launches, um, but they license Rocket Lab launches from New Zealand and all of the launches from here in the U.S. Yep. Let's see here. Uh, Go ahead. If either of you see them, please pick them out. Uh, those are the ones I had. I think. I think it's all that I could see here. Uh, let's see. I think we do have one more thing that we can talk about a little bit. Um, There was a really great article that Sawyer put together, and we're actually making a video about this article, sort of setting expectations for the first Starship launch. Now, chat, again, is going to yell at me for this because nobody wants to hear this, but uh, we actually put together a list of historic scrubs. (laughs) The word that no one ever wants to hear... We think on that it's launch day. yeah on launch day. We think that it's pretty likely that Starship may go through multiple scrubs because it's the first time they've ever launched the system. Now, because I've said that out loud, Elon's going to just YOLO and yeet it into the ocean or whatever the kids are saying these days. <laughs> hit the big red button. Um, but Sawyer actually went through the history of big launches and did like a compendium, an explanation of all the different scrubs that have happened. And it is more frequent than you think when you have a huge new system coming online that you might not get it sent the first time unless it's falcon heavy um but whatever um true (laughs) that's that's another thing that we've been sort of working on here but as these dates come out right as more dates come out spacex is going to go for it one day they're going to have a launch license they're going to have a stacked full stack they're going to clear the uh, the village and abandon not abandon evacuate the area and all the things that they need to do but even on that day (laughs) Don't be disappointed because we expect there. it's very likely there's going to be multiple scrubs leading up to the actual attempt. We're doing an entire video of it. So if you're interested in hearing about historic scrubs and why it's better to scrub your launch than to blow up your launch pad and have a huge, super heavy rocket fall back down on it, um, we have an entire thing where we're sort of talking about that. But I know that's not what people want to hear. Just I feel that it's important as you're wanting to go down there in chat. Who is trying to go and see this in person? Who is going Mm. to destroy the cell network on the day of the first (laughs) attempt so that none of our cameras work and we have to go to our alternate plans? Raise your hand in chat if you're planning on doing that. Um, Just keep in mind, it may be difficult to sucker the family into going with you. (laughs) You have to take time off work. You have trips. You have to schedule a flight out there. You're booking hotels and stuff like that. All the different things that you could do, just please keep in mind, this is rocket chasing. And it may be very difficult to actually catch Super Heavy's first launch because it may not go the first time. It just par for the course. It's difficult to catch Super Heavy, too. It's right? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, Anyways, what else do we have to cover here, Thomas? We got one more thing that we should look ahead to, right, Dust? So we're coming up in the last couple minutes here. Yep. Yeah. Um, We got something coming up tomorrow, I think. Real quick, that video is releasing on Wednesday. (laughs) Uh, Kevin, oh, nice. yeah, Kevin, who's working on that video, managing that video in the background, just uh, sent us a message saying that history of scrubs 
we had to get licensing from TLC for the whole video, I think, um, is going to come out <laughs> Wednesday. Now it has to come oh. out Wednesday because I just said it on the stream. Yeah, now we announced it, so it can't get delayed anymore. You can't yep. scrub oh the launch of the video, <laughs> Kevin and Sawyer and rest of team that are working on it. It's been announced. <laughs> Uh, yes. But speaking of announcements, that's ah. what's coming up tomorrow, right, Dust? Mm-hmm. Let's grab that. What are we getting tomorrow? So tomorrow, and this is something that, obviously, it's going to be covered on NASA TV. I don't think we'll have our own dedicated broadcast of it because it'll be on NASA TV. But we'll be covering it on our social media channels, and we'll surely be talking about it for weeks and months to come. The crew of Artemis II, the first crewed flight of the Orion spacecraft on the SLS rocket, and the first crewed mission to the moon since 1972, that crew gets announced tomorrow. Uh, it'll be three American NASA astronauts and one astronaut from the Canadian Space Agency on this flight, the exact names of which are to be known by a select few people until tomorrow. Um, and uh, they'll be on this free return trajectory. You see the graphic here for a short mission to the moon. It won't be as long as Artemis 1. The point of Artemis 1 was a more lengthy test set of all of Orion's systems and all this stuff. And now that we know that all works, the first crewed flight can test things much more quickly, and it's only like a week-long mission or something like that. Um, yep. But they will be the first people to visit the moon, per se, uh, for a very long time. It won't be a landing mission. This is the pre predecessor to the landing mission on Artemis 3. I don't know if I got that word right, but we're going to roll with it. Um, I think it works. Yeah, I think it works. But that'll be a very exciting announcement tomorrow regardless to see who is going to be on that flight. Yep. It's just the second launch, right? Like, it's not, oh, we're going to launch 100 times before we put people on this system. It is, we launched it once, Artemis 1. That's the video that's rolling here in the, in the background. We, of course, covered that. Watched the live stream on that. But uh, the second time SLS launches it will have crew right yeah yep. it's crazy to think about but yeah it's sort of a deal so I mean, there's things the, the first flight went so well that gives you a ton of confidence it's got a lot of flight even the vehicle even though this particular configuration has only flown once shuttle engines have been flying for years the boosters have been flying for years even the upper stage has a ton of experience so there are parts of this system that have been thoroughly tested on other vehicles um Orion there's a lot, has there's a lot to give plenty twice. of confidence on this flight. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. It flew on a Delta IV, didn't it? Heavy. Yep. I did. It likes orange so, rockets, I guess. Um, yeah, so yeah, two orange rockets for true. one capsule. <laughs> very true. <laughs> Sorry. But yeah, so the, it, it, there's a lot of reason to have a lot of confidence, and obviously they're going to be very careful on it regardless. Um, but this is exciting. This is, think, SpaceX Demo 2 or Boeing crew flight test. Like, it's almost a demo flight because you've tested it already. This is the last step before you do the thing, before you start doing the thing the wreck was designed to do, which is get humans to the surface of the moon. And Artemis 3 will deliver that crew that goes to the surface. That is technically a, the, te the test flight of the crewed landing, because there'll be an uncrewed landing ahead of that. So the landing's now a test flight, but the flight to the moon will be operational. Depends on how you word it, of course. But regardless, um, very, very exciting to get this announcement out of the way tomorrow as we get closer and closer to processing the sls vehicle for artemis 2 starts processing this summer so yep yeah. let's go i am mean, uh... saw go ahead Ian. i was gonna say they uh, integrated the engine section onto the core stage uh, over the past mm. few weeks um coming up should be engine integration itself so that's the last major step for that core stage they're going to ship that out to kennedy space center around the summer or so it's going to be stored there for a little bit because um, they're waiting on the Orion capsule to do some processing on that to finish some testing. Um, but yeah, Artemis 2 is pretty far along in the pre-flight processing, and it's it's exciting. We got another big step for it coming tomorrow. I'm going to be on the lookout for all the NASA social posts. I've seen they're doing a NASA social for the announce. And you always have the official, wow. you know, here's the official headshots of the astronauts, and here's the official press announcement and that sort of thing. And then you have the NASA social people that are out there like, oh, my gosh, I got an astronaut, like selfies with the astronauts <laughs> and stuff. Um, I always look forward to that. They, they have the NASA social program where they have, I'm not even going to say social media influencers just social media folks like you have an account right. on social media yeah. and you can social apply media users yeah, yeah social media users yeah. exactly and, and you can apply you don't even have to have 10,000 followers or anything you can have 
500 followers and maybe mm-hmm. you tweet about space news or maybe you don't um, be on the lookout for NASA socials I've seen a lot of people very excited about going to the astronaut announcement and I'm sure they'll be out there but it's something that it, basically everyone can get involved with anybody can apply you don't have to have 20,000 followers or whatever right I did quite a few NASA socials back in the day and I really look forward to the raw excitement that comes from that group as opposed to and now unveil the astronaut or whatever I guess they're not going to like cover the astronaut with a sheet show me the door. astronaut behind door number two <laughs> yeah, exactly it's like astronaut dating program or something <laughs> like, anyways um so let me do one more set of thanks here for everybody that's been supporting our stream merry old elf we appreciate you very much had a super chat coming through we've got roseanne divasto divasto says thanks ian for an explanation we put out there ian thank you You're for welcome. that <laughs> uh, Steve Ehrman did a super chat as well. We've got Neptune's orbit. Is it cleared or not? It's always the question when it's <laughs> Neptune's orbit, but thank you for becoming a red team member. Whichever way you slice it. Steve Ehrman, another super chat. No message. Uh, John said the booster disconnect has been tested. It looks quick when it disconnects. Oh, yeah. yeah. We actually have wow. uh, some video <laughs> of that that I could bring up here. Um uh, I'm going to keep it going for now. We had the video of that on the channel. I have it in the yeah. links document even, but I didn't show it. Either way, John, thank you for the support. Callum Chamberlain with some pounds sterling says, hi, can you shout me out? So. Yes. <laughs> Sup. How are we doing? Sup, Callum. <laughs> Uh, Moldy Space Industries gifted five more red team memberships. There we always see Moldy Space's <laughs> name in the chat. Dear Breck, let's just go with Brett on this one. Thomas, can we talk about this real quick? How do they enforce the Notemar way out in the ocean? It's like radar and the Coast Guard runs out there, or they just radio yeah. them, or what? Yeah, so there there are radar assets that can be used to detect vessels, and so they don't have to like have people like out there with binoculars like looking. Um, you can use radar to know whether it's clear or not, and then if they need to go out and intercept a boat or something, the Coast Guard's got boats. Coast Guard's also got air assets like a helicopter or something, which is a little bit faster. So there, there are ways to uh, um, go out there and address a problem if you need to, but they can monitor it more or less remotely. Right. They keep eyes on it, and they start in advance for boats that are even going in that direction that yep. looks like in some future time they may cross into that during the the activation time. And they'll call on the radio and be like, hey, just you know, like be advised XYZ hazard area is active and they'll communicate and make sure that they're going to avoid it and whatever. Yep, absolutely. Good question there, Brett. Thank you so much for the support. Uh, here's one from Zip P. It says, after going down there and seeing the size of the second stage booster, I completely would understand why they wouldn't want to catch it on the first try. They'd do mm-hmm. a lot of damage if it went wrong. Yeah, the, the super heavy booster is massive. And it sounds like you've made it down yeah. to Starpace Zip. In... Starship is massive too. I mean, they're going to try Everything and catch is. that eventually, but yeah. Yep. Yeah. So it makes sense. We've said it over and over again on the streams. They have more ships and boosters than they have launch sites. Right? Yeah. Like it's easier to build and <laughs> roll out another booster that they're already working yeah. on than it is to repair the tower from scratch. So just a few more here. Ch- Chad Simplico, thank you for becoming a Capcom member. Uh, let's see here. Douglas Richardson says RGV showed Alex's map with the timeline of 90 minutes to Hawaii. Correct time? That's how orbits work, about. right? About. It should be about, yeah. 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 Roughly, I know they put, uh, like, when uh, uh, Marco and uh, Jonathan were working on it, they had, like, T plus 5, 10, 15. They had some little hash marks on there. But it yeah. is about 90 minutes because that's how long it takes to go around the Earth at stay-in-orbit velocities. Uh, yeah. Just making sure I can get all these. Stephen Willett, thank you so much for becoming a Capcom member. Uh, two more from John, actually. John, you've done quite a few chats here. Let's see if we can answer these last questions for you. Question asked this morning about stage separation timing. What's the minimal safe distance for the second stage to ignite when it clears the first stage booster? I don't think SpaceX has released that, but mm-hmm. it may be closer than you think. Sure, yeah. Uh, not not sure exactly, but I, I'm looking forward to like more like an ascent timeline from SpaceX, yep. which well, they should do just like they do for like Falcon 9 missions and stuff. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, so again, that's one of the things, like could we guess, and oh, there's this much fuel and it burns this fast. Wait, wait till SpaceX releases the official thing and uh, we'll see exactly the difference. Like, is it going to fly apart slightly? Are they going to let it close some amount? Are they going to light the engines? When are they going to light it? We've never seen it before. They've never done it before. Mm-hmm. So we're going to see what they're planning and then we'll see what actually happens when they launch the thing. 
Uh, John, and what would Starship Safe Zone be for its second stage ignition after separation? Again, the same sort of question there. I appreciate that it was in two Super Chats. Um, but the same sort of question, like, is SpaceX going to let it coast? Are they going to light one engine and three engines or something like that? Like, let's wait for SpaceX to give the official word. I imagine they are going to light all of them, but we, we haven't seen, like, explosive separation or anything like that. Uh, that old illustration from Elon had them sort of like flipping it off the top, right? Well, let's see what SpaceX officially mm. releases as the plan for what they're doing. And then lastly here, <laughs> oh, it's Brett with Diabetic Kid. Sorry, Brett, you've said that to us before, and I just glanced at it and didn't get it right. Um, Brett, <laughs> I'll just continue to call you Brett, says it's pronounced like Diabetic Kid with Brett in the middle. It's always funny to watch us try. We will continue to try for you if you keep showing up Brett. What am I, 10 minutes over time here? We're About. fine. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I want to see, hang on a second, y'all. Time out. Boy, uh, whenever Da says hold on, you know you're in uh, for a treat. Nick and I have been doing a lot of work at uh, Starbase. Uh-oh. Oh, boy. A lot of work at Starbase. Uh -oh. um, <clears throat> working on infrastructure to support the orbital flight. Okay. Because there's always like the end of the stream. The orbital asterisk flight. Yeah, yeah, the orbital asterisk flight, right? There's always the end of the stream, <laughs> and then everybody's like, ugh, ugh, you know, I, I left. They said they're ending the stream. I already, I already jumped off. There's still 3,000 people watching. So consider this a sort of secret behind the scenes bit of advice. We've been working with a hotel out there at South Padre Island, and it is the hotel that has the best views of the orbital launch pad. Hotel was recently closed, and while they were closed, Nick and I were out there working on infrastructure at the hotel. But it's not like sponsor. They didn't pay us for this for anything. But I know the marketing guy, and they've just released the booking site for Margarita, Margarita, Margaritaville Beach Resort at South Padre Island. Again, they're not paying us for this or anything. They are letting us hang out at their hotel for some flights. But uh, this is available now, and the south-facing rooms on the 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, and 10th floors can see the orbital launch mount. So when dates start to come out, there are going to be people jumping on this, making reservations. I actually have a reservation there for the 6th through the 12th. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Even no. though I know, I know that it was going to change, I booked a room personally for my mom and my brother to watch from as soon as they did that. It's like, oh, oh the, the suite's coming out. Oh, I was going to book it right now. Um, check the cancellation policies and stuff like that. The hotel was previously renovated. Again, they're not paying us for this or anything like that, but they are very nice to us, and they are letting us uh, do some work over there on and around the roof of the hotel for our orbital coverage. And I literally walked around. I walked around with the marketing guy, and I was like, all right, marketing guy, we are going to walk your hotel and determine which rooms can actually see the orbital launch map. <laughs> and we walked up and down all the floors. Look, okay, that one can see that. Oh, fifth floor. Okay, these first three can see, but these can't. Um, so anyways, want to help them out because they helped us out. It's Margar Margaritaville Beach Resort, South Padre Island. It's freshly renovated and stuff like that. Again, this isn't paid or anything. They're not paying us for an ad. I just wanted to let the people who knew around here, as soon as dates are n mentioned, check the website here because you may be able to get a room facing the right way. At Margaritaville, <laughs> gosh, I cannot say it. I really have to. Pre the Thomas, words, try to it. Fair. Thomas, you try it. Margarita Beach Resort, South Padre Island, Texas. Close. Did it's got it a right? ville in it. Margaritaville. Ian. Ah, oh, crap. <laughs> Margaritaville Beach Resort, South Padre Island, Texas. Nice. You're on the hook for all uh, nice future up. mentions. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, um, again, y'all, I'm, I'm not. They, they didn't pay us a bunch of money. This isn't like an official ad, but they did allow us to install some stuff on their hotel for the orbital test flight. So again, that's the disclosure of it. Website's available for booking now. When dates come out, like have that thing on speed dial because I am going to hear a date, book it, and then remind you about it. <laughs> In that order. <laughs> Smart, Anyways, um, let's continue on here. I think that is going to bring us to the end of the show since I... <laughs> no. <laughs> We didn't buy a hotel. No, no. No, we didn't buy a hotel. We didn't pay the hotel anything. The hotel didn't pay us anything. Um, we basically paid Home Depot no a lot of money. No, no money going back then? and forth. They just gave us access. Um, and because of that, we're, we're telling people the hotel that has the most number of rooms that can see the south-facing views of the orbital launch mount. So anyways, put that site on speed dial. We didn't purchase a hotel. We didn't get that many super chats. 
<laughs> um, last qu- Hey, let's do this last question and shut the stream down. Drunar has asked lots of great questions, done lots of super chats as well. Do you think reentry or spa- splashdown will be visible from Hawaii? Yes. Reentry, yes. yes. Splashdown. I don't really know. Oh, yeah, splashdown is, but reentry, absolutely. Yes, especially okay. if it's nighttime or twilight which it doesn't see, it seems like it's gonna yes. be afternoon but during the it's day gonna be in the middle of the day or afternoon well actually well during the day there's a solid chance you might see something it's five hours oh wait, wait hold on what time oh. does the window open central time to us uh, uh it was six twenty-five a.m central is that right i is thought that it was right, right I, th- I thought it was 11 hour. but now i'm wondering if we got the it was to- 11 zulu correctly. which yeah. is gmt i think which is 6 a.m central early yes. the most likely here we go alex is clarifying the most likely window is 8 a.m to noon central time and hawaii time is five hours behind uh central time so when it's 8 a.m in hawaii it's three or sorry when it's 8 a.m at boca it's 3 oh. a.m at hawaii you got 90 minutes to get around right so if even so if it launched for, at 8 so it could be like it could be dark in hawaii when it re-enters yep it could if it's at the end of the window it'll be around it'll be early morning if it launched at noon, so possible. then it'd be one thirty as it went around, and then subtract five hours from that, which would be three. It'd be about nine, I guess, yeah. like a little bit nine thirty or something like that. Is that right? Nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Yeah, 20. yeah, yeah, yeah. So if it launches early in the window, it may be coming down to jellyfish conditions. Oh, <laughs> or true. If it's, it won't have exhaust <laughs> to be illuminated. Yeah, yeah. It won't have exhaust. That's true. But uh, the oh, plasma well, trail. You see, like little RCS puffs, maybe get backlit or something. I don't know. I don't know. It, no, mostly plasma would be the thing you're actually seeing. But yeah, we've never seen it before. So, uh, anyways, if it's dark in the sky, let's put it this way: if it's still dark in Hawaii, you are very likely to see a starship re-entering, assuming it makes it that far. <laughs> right? Assuming it, yes, that is a big, big assumption. <laughs> right. Important so. caveat. Yeah. Um, apparently if we zoom in on this map, yeah, there's the little, so you got Honolulu here. This is a uh, Kawa. Anybody know how to pronounce that? I've never been able to afford a trip to Hawaii. Um, I Kauai. think it's pronounced Kauai. Kauai. It's Hawaii with a K. I'll take it. Nice. Um, and this is like, uh, what? 50, 60 miles north of there. Can I measure distances? In Google earth, you can not Google maps. <laughs> yeah, not on Google maps. Anyways. If it's coming down and it's dark in the sky, you're probably going to see it. And it all comes down to exactly in the window when it launches. Add the time to fly most of the way around the Earth. And uh, if it's dark, I think that you will see it. You know, all of the weather preventing or weather preventing you if there's clouds or whatever, you know. I think even if it's daytime, you should see something. You should see, it obviously won't be as spectacular as it would be at night. But you should see something if you know which direction to look in. Yep. yep. For sure. All right. Good question there at the end. Folks, y'all have been ridiculously generous to us today. All the super chats and people buying stuff from the merch store and and gifted memberships. So many gifted memberships, I lost count. Um, Whichever way you do it, we cannot say thank you enough for supporting what we do so that we can send me to Hawaii for the... No, I'm kidding. Um, (laughs) So that we can send me to Starbase this week is actually what you help pay for. Um, But thank you so much for all your support that makes this possible. Uh, With me today, I had... Mr. Ian Atkinson. Ian, thank you so much. It was great to be here. A fun episode, as always. Excellent. And uh, Thomas Burghardt as well. Thomas, thank you for spending Sunday with us. Absolutely, yeah. And, uh, pleasure as always. Thank you so much. People are pointing out the facial hair gradient we've had. We've had, like, <laughs> full true. thrust. We do have that going on. Like this, whatever you want to call this, lazy DOS, <laughs> and then Ian. On Clean this shaven. End. Clean shaven, You Ian. were saying I, Jack needs to be on my uh, my side over here. That'll have the full gradient going. Then I think that would be, like, an exponential curve, then. <laughs> <laughs> Jack would be off the monitor to the left-hand side, I think. That's how long his beard is. Um, anyways, folks. I've been rambling. We've had a lot of fun with the show. Thank you all so much for joining us today. My name is John Galloway for NSF, and that is the end of this week's NASA Space Flight Live, NSF Live. And we will see you nerds later. I'm going to play the music because I can. Only once this time, not twice. (laughs) It's that button. Pressure looks good. Call her now. Water towers can fly! Ego down phenomenal. Water down, I'll see you
Yikes. You bet. Okay. We don't need any more of these.